hello and uh, welcome to lecture three of the enterprise software development uh, 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 in Python uh, course presented by Compatible. Uh, my name is Alexander Sokol, uh, and uh, today's lecture is uh, planned for 90 minutes, about 60 minutes of material, uh, and 30 minutes uh, for open discussions and questions. Regarding the questions, uh, as in previous lectures, due to the large number of participants, uh, I cannot uh, speak and monitor the chat. So, uh, or answer questions live uh, due to time constraints. So if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat and my colleagues uh, will either answer them directly or will alert me through the private chat and then I'll be able to answer them uh, at the appropriate time. So the topic of today's uh, uh, lecture is um, UDM and ORM. Right. First of all, what is, uh, you know, everybody probably knows what ORM is, right? So object relational mapping. So what's ODM? ODM is object document mapping. And uh, that's a type of mapping uh, which maps, uh, you know, both of them map uh, data to database records. Uh, one of them maps uh, data to database records using uh, relational database schema and joins. And the other one, object document mapping, uh, does it in a style that's appropriate for document databases, but can also be used for relational and other database types. So why are we talking about data and schema in, uh, in, in the enterprise Python course? Uh, because uh, we're doing this because uh, one of the uh, key topics that uh, software engineers who work on large scale systems uh, have to learn and have to do which are not normally taught in a Python course, course, is working from Python with data, right? So this is not a database design course, even though anyone who previously attended a database design course uh, would certainly benefit um, uh, from that knowledge. Uh, and it's also not a core Python course, uh, you know, Python syntax and so forth. So uh, what do lecture rather. So today uh, we will be talking specifically about how to work with databases from Python. And uh, there are two ways of doing it. So one way to do it uh, is to uh, take the database API, uh, creates dictionaries, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or uh, arrays of data, you know, basically creates maybe a pandas table and uh, send uh, the data to the database using the API uh, without creating a set of objects to hold this data in memory. So that's, you know, an acceptable way, of course, to uh, work with databases. However, as your software gets larger and uh, as you know, it acquires more data types and in large enterprise uh, software, even if it's a well-designed software, there are normally thousands of tables. Sometimes it's uh, over 10,000 tables. And for a lot of uh, software applications, it's not an indication of bad design. Uh, of course, if you're building uh, something like uh, you know, a chat uh, system or a messenger, uh, and you have a 10,000 tables, you're probably doing something wrong, right? Because uh, in a system like that, uh, you need um, uh, you know, user record, you need the message record, uh, you need perhaps a record for a like and so forth, right? So you'll probably end up with maybe tens of uh, records in total uh, as opposed to thousands. However, a lot of enterprise systems uh, deal with very complex data. And this complex data, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, there are applications that uh, in which the business domain has very complex data. Uh, the topic uh, you know, of the previous course on mathematical finance was one where data is very complex. Uh, there are uh, you know, tens of thousands of tables in most uh, software systems to hold uh, data for financial securities because uh, there are a lot of securities, each has different set of fields uh, and generally a large system for uh, trading, right? So in, you know, especially if this is a system for uh, for the sell side, what's called the sell side, uh, namely banks trading with each other, uh, it will have uh, over thousands of tables just to hold the trades, you know, and, and uh, probably a lot more. Uh, there are also sometimes, uh, you know, the uh, technology itself requires a lot of tables. For example, uh, when you're building a complex uh, machine learning software, for example, for speech recognition, you will also have very complex data. Uh, each of your machine learning uh, algorithms will require you know, its own set of uh, uh, classes. And as your system grows, uh, unless you design your data well, uh, you will eventually start getting a lot of uh, bugs and errors where the field is in the wrong place and so forth. So we will uh, learn today how to build, uh, how to work with data from Python and specifically how to work with databases in a way that scales very well. 
So namely, it will work very well if you have 10 tables, if you work very well if you have 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. This cannot be said for every way to work with data. Because some ways of working with data, they're fine if you have 10 tables and uh, you have to keep a lot of things in memory if you have 100. And then when you have 1,000, nobody can really uh, work on anything and the code becomes very buggy and also very fragile. So, uh, so one you know, issue is uh, being able to just work with the code when you're first writing it. And the other issue uh, with complex schemas uh, that has to, you know, that requires a lot of attention is fragility, right? So sometimes the system and especially its data model becomes so complicated that you cannot really touch anything without breaking the tests, right? So in other words, the system works, but the moment that you're trying to change something, you add a field, remove a field, it starts breaking down because there is no schema, there's no way to control uh, you know, the structure of your data. So today we will work with small examples uh, or a small set of examples, but these examples, uh, or, you know, sorry, sorry, differently, an example with, you know, the one small number of data types, right? So we'll uh, take an example from the mathematical finance course uh, and work uh, with uh, an example of, uh, you know, financial transaction and uh, what's inside this transaction. But uh, the reason we're doing it uh, and this is why it may seem a bit of an overkill, you know, for these two tables, is because this way that we will be working with data is going to scale, scale, and um, still, uh, you know, provide a very good experience of working with data when these two tables become ten tables, and then a hundred tables, and then a thousand tables. All right. So uh, uh, let me just uh, one second. Uh, is there a question, or is it uh, something that was before in the chat? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, you're seeing the, only the first slide. Yeah, that's okay. I'm still talking. So actually, um, uh, I found that uh, in the previous two lectures, I spent a lot of time on the slides uh, and uh, perhaps not enough time on the code. Uh, in fact, in the very first lecture, there was more time as, uh, you know, we, we, we've uh, confirmed looking at the recording that there was more time on the slides in the first lecture. Uh, then uh, on the code. So as we advance toward the final lectures of the course, it's going to become a lot more hands-on. So today uh, and, to, and uh, two days from now, slides will be more or less a guidance uh, for the, during the presentation, slides will be just a guidance for, for the topics. So, you know, so I'm, I'm just going to, uh, to move to the next slide when we uh, get started. Uh, but then uh, when we post uh, um, uh, the course materials, there will be video recording and also will be, uh, you know, a more detailed set of slides that will uh, have screenshots of the examples that I'm going through live. So the reason I'm still on the first slide is because I'm still going through the introduction, and I want to do it, um, uh, you know, right uh, before I get into the uh, code because uh, you know, I'm trying to convince you I'm talking about, you know, something extremely important, namely that the way that you decide to work with data in your uh, project, uh, many different ways may seem equally applicable, but as your so software grows, only some of this will uh, scale, uh, namely continue to work well uh, as you get more tables and more data types. Let's uh, go to the first topic, uh, which is that there are um, uh, a few more, uh, regretfully, uh, data class frameworks to learn. Okay, so why are there more data class frameworks to learn? So when we, and let, with that, let me just uh, switch to the, um, uh, uh, to PyCharm, right? So when we uh, went uh, uh, in the beginning through data classes, right? And that was the topic um, of our first two lectures. Uh, we learned about the way to work with classes in Python that's suitable for data classes, namely for classes whose primary purpose is to hold the data. And today, of course, uh, we'll be working with data, so we'll need classes like that, right? But also, uh, these classes are, in a lot of cases, also a very good way to, to write normal classes, right? So it's classes whose uh, primary role is to work with functions rather than with data. So, uh, you know, we, we looked at unsafe class, right? So it's a class that uh, kind of does not use any of the type annotations or safety features of Python and looks like that. All right, so I'm right now rehashing the material, just quickly reviewing the material from, from the previous uh, two lectures. All right, so uh, so we learned about the unsafe class, right? So that's a class which does not use uh, any of the Python type safety features uh, or any of the, uh, um, uh, or any of the uh, um, 
uh, you know, kind of safer, you know, safeguards that uh, Python provides uh, when you work with complex data. So this is what's called unsafe class, uh, where basically you just assign the attribute without fixing the type. And uh, as we've discovered during uh, uh, lecture two, if you mistype or you know if you make um, a typo in the name of the attribute, instead of correcting you as uh, Python with type annotations uh, would, or uh, um, you know C plus plus or Java or C sharp or other languages, uh, it will simply create a second attribute and you'll have two, and that's not what you intend. Okay, so then we discovered that there is a safer way to do it, uh, which is a, a slows class, right? But the problem with slows class is that you have to specify things in many places, right? You have to put the names of attributes here, and then again here, and then again here. Okay, so why uh, only one person knows? His name is Guido Van Rossum, and he's not talking. He's the inventor of Python. So I think it would, be, would have been possible, probably, I hope, um, uh, you know, to create it uh, all at once, but not, right? But uh, eventually, uh, frameworks that deal with that were created. So, you know, Python does not have a good syntax for data classes out of the box, but it has this incredibly powerful feature called the decorator, uh, which, takes a class and so decorator is a function and you've seen it before. It's uh, uh, the way that you define it is the um, uh, ampersand and then the name of the decorator. And what this does uh, is that it uh, is a function that creates a class, changes the what the class is, right? So changes the class definition and gives it back to you when you're importing, right? So in other words, before when you wrote the class and before you use the class, it goes through the import uh, namely reading from uh, disk into Python interpreter. And during that, the decorator, decorator will execute and change the class. So data class is the built-in, you know, official Python way to work with data in which we're, you know, likely back to just one place where you have to define the attribute. And there's also utters, which is a third party library, which actually was the foundation of data class, which is also likewise only one place you define the attribute. And then uh, that's where uh, you know we start uh, realizing that uh, we're in trouble, because uh, every library that needs to have data classes, and especially uh, before you know maybe if data class was in Python from the very beginning, uh, that would not have happened. But in the absence of data class in Python, and data class was only added uh, two versions back in 3.6. So in um, uh, uh, sorry, 3.3. Actually, I'm just thinking the 3.8, I think. Yeah, uh, I may be off by version. So, um, uh, so in the absence of an official way to work with data classes, uh, each of these frameworks, uh, each of the, you know, or I say not each, but many, many of the data libraries, uh, and what I mean by libraries for working with data, right? Libraries which provide access to databases, relational databases, document databases, and so forth, decided to uh, create their own framework. And not to be outdone, uh, libraries that um, uh, work with REST, and REST is the topic of our, namely, uh, doing um, uh, you know basically microservices and cloud software, uh, and we talk uh, to each other through REST services, so RESTful services. So uh, these libraries also either use one of many you know proliferated um, uh, libraries for uh, data class, uh, one of these alternatives uh, for data class that so you can you can choose. Uh, or create their own. So we already learned about address. There's a third party library that was the foundation of data class. Then data class was forked through it uh, and address continued to develop on their own. Uh, Pydentic is another one uh, with slightly different emphasis, which we will use uh, two days from now in the discussion of REST because it's the foundation of REST API. Uh, and of course, uh, today, you know, we're working with uh, two databases and guess what, you know, the libraries for these two databases or, or, you know, the Python packages for working with those two databases, each use their own object relational object document mapping. Uh, that's unfortunate and uh, Python uh, uh, community is trying to correct it. More and more libraries uh, are able to work with data class. So for the moment, uh, just because the work we, working with data class requires so many custom um, you know, hacks and annotations on top of data class, that's really not um, you know, a very good integration. I'm using the native uh, data classes for these libraries. Uh, I think you know maybe a couple of versions later, uh, they will set the right defaults. Uh, maybe you know, a new API will come out uh, and uh, it will be possible to just use data class for everything. 
But at the moment, uh, there are multiple libraries, uh, and each of these libraries does whatever uh, you know the purpose of the package is. Like for example, uh, the library that works with relational databases has the possibility to add uh, relational, uh, you know, basically foreign keys and so forth uh, to the uh, class definition. Uh, object document uh, mapping, which works with document databases, makes it possible to specify things like indexes. Uh, and in the end, uh, we're essentially, you know, getting uh, two more of these libraries. But, uh, you know, we already learned uh, three, uh, plus a native way to do it with slots. So, you know, two more is nothing. So, you know, let's, let's just uh, go ahead and learn them. All right, so now, uh, before we learn them, uh, I wanted to um, uh, set up uh, the topic uh, for, uh, 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 or rather, you know, what we're going to model, right? And I thought that uh, instead of having, having table one or table two, it's going to be more fun uh, to have something relevant uh, to, you know, perhaps uh, a career that you may choose, uh, you know, for example, that's what our, our company does. Uh, namely, we're going to make an, to choose an example uh, from uh, financial software, right? So our company specializes in that. Uh, you know, we had the whole mathematical finance course uh, dealing with this, and uh, this is why um, uh, you know I thought that it would, would be a good example. So let me uh, just for the moment show a slide from the uh, mathematical finance course, uh, so I can introduce this example. Okay, so vanilla interest rate swap uh, is one of the most widely used uh, derivatives. And I assume you know what derivatives are, they're options, right? So if you haven't uh, used them uh, or studied them, you probably heard of them, right? Call options, put options and so forth. But the swap is an instrument uh, whose purpose is to exchange a stream of payments between two parties. So one party pays the floating interest rate, namely the interest rate that goes up and down. And the other party pays the fixed interest rate. So the fixed interest rate uh, is, uh, uh, you know, when, when the interest rates are low and they may go high, fixed rate is good because you're protected from going high. Uh, when the interest rates are high, but they may get low, uh, floating rate may seem good, but, you know, they may also go even higher, so it's more risky. So uh, in a swap, and the swap here is in the bottom of this diagram, there are two legs. Leg is a stream of payments, right, a sequence of payments. So if I am obligated to pay someone else uh, payments every month in a certain currency at a certain interest rate, right? So it may be a fixed interest rate, like 5% or 3%, or it may be a floating interest rate such that I look up, look it up in the newspaper or more precisely financial information service. And that's the rate I use, right? Maybe one day is 1%, one day is 2%. So the swap consists of two legs. And the important thing about the swap and the legs is that the legs have no meaning outside the swap, right? So this example is not like, um, uh, you know, it's not like an example um, uh, where, you know, you have, uh, you know, there are less classical examples, uh, you know, parent and children, right? So, but the old persons, right? So there's a parent and there's a child and each one of them also maybe is a person. So the child record and the parent record that's a typical example work used in database uh, courses. Uh, both of them are humans, persons, and uh, each one of them should have his own key. You know, they, they should be, it should be possible to work with the child as with the person on things which don't relate to the parent. Uh, and, uh, you know, this record should exist in its own right. But for the leg, that's not the case, right? So leg of the swap, namely a stream of payments, only makes sense inside the swap. You don't really need to work with it separately. And when you don't need to work with it separately, you have four ways to organize the fields of the swap relative to the fields uh, of the and fields of the leg in a schema. And I'm going to uh, uh, open the um, uh, uh, the uh, Excel um, uh, kind of basically just a little table that I put together in Excel to demonstrate this. Right, so let me. Uh, go here, right? So, uh, so we have this source folder, and now there's a diagrams folder. Okay, so let's take a look. The fields that we have, as you know, we, we just talked about the swap, right? So the swap uh, is a trade, right? It's, it's a transaction executed between two parties. So we have two swaps here: T1 and T2. T is because it's a trade, right? And both of these types are swap. We're going to add. Uh, I didn't put it in Excel, uh, but we're going to add also another type called a bond. 
Okay, and then there are legs, right? And in relational database, and uh, you know, this is the, the way to do it uh, that, um, uh, you know, used to be the only way, right? So, so it used to be the only way, uh, you know, before document databases appeared, before name value, key value uh, stores appeared, and before white column databases appeared, like Cassandra. Uh, relational database was more or less the only way to work with data. You know, well, one of the reasons is, uh, you know, uh, that um, uh, there are certain things that modern computers make it possible that older computers and slower and computers with less memory, especially, it's not even the speed, but uh, computers that did not have less, you know, a lot of memory in the past, uh, it's easier for them to work with relational databases than with modern document databases because uh, modern databases, which are not relational, no SQL databases, right? So this is, you know, so so the first the first graph here. Let me just uh, highlight it, right? So this, right, is a relational database or a SQL database. <clears throat> there are, you know, there are some differences uh, in this term. You know, there are a lot of databases that uh, use SQL, even though they're not relationals. But I'll use them interchangeably. Uh, so, relational database, uh, which is again, so the schema highlighted here. Uh, first of all, you know, normally SQL is the query language for the relational database. But the key thing in the relational database is that. Uh, you store, uh, it uses what's called a third normal form, right? Or, or strives to achieve it. Sometimes that's not possible. Such that uh, each piece of data is stored only once. And uh, there is another thing about relational databases that um, uh, is not kind of the formal schema design, um, uh, you know, definition. But uh, relational databases normally are not good at storing in their tables anything other than atomic values, like a string, uh, you know, an integer, a floating number, date. Right, so relational databases, even though nowadays, right, so modern relational database can store, uh, and some of them actually are attempting to be, uh, you know, quite good at it, right, and, and, and perhaps succeeding somewhat, right, like box arrays, right? So relational databases can store arrays, can store documents, but still they're not designed for that, right? So, so the relational databases that are designed to store just a single value in the cell. And when you have a table, if we want to define a swap, right? So we have trade ID. So the swap, our swap uh, will have this a swap table, right? We'll have a trade ID. Okay. It has a trade type, which is swap. Okay. So far, so good, right? So it's a table. Each column has a value, both strings. Okay. But now we're having, uh, you know, we, we, now we have a dilemma, right? We have legs, right? So we have two legs, and each leg has its own data right so it's a hierarchical definition uh, you know of the uh, it's a hierarchical definition of the uh, instrument so the swap has two legs one is a stream of fixed payments another is a stream of floating payments and each of these legs has its own currency and its own type fixed or floating is the type and currency could be us dollar euro uh, british pound and so forth of course, in reality, swap has a lot more field attributes or columns or fields, uh, and so does the leg. But we just put a few, uh, you know, to illustrate the database design. All right. So in a relational database, what you would do is that you would have one-to-many relationship, right? You would say each swap has two legs, each leg has atomic fields. In fact, uh, each leg may also have further deeply hierarchical data, so it may have another set of arrays inside. So there's something called cash flow, and each leg has many cash flows. It's a single payment. But for now, let's just assume it's just a leg, right? And there's nothing deeper. So there are two legs per swap, but we cannot store arrays, right? We cannot just uh, say we're going to package it up on a document. Or rather, we can, but relational databases are not, not designed for it. So we're going to create a new table for a leg, right? And each entry in this table has leg type, leg currency, and this should be a unique leg ID. Okay, and then uh, trade ID is here, so you note which trade the leg belongs, right? So here you say trade one, here you say trade two. So that's a classical one-to-many relationship uh, in a relational database. Now, the problem with, with that relationship is that uh, the way that's, 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 that's basically that normally that you know, relational database design is done. So the problem with that uh, uh, approach is that in order to extract a single swap, right? Suppose that you just need to extract a single swap. Instead of just reading one record, which is easier, 
you need to, to do a query. What kind of query? You need to find all of the trades for which trade ID is a type, right? So when you do that, uh, the query, you know, basically has to go through the entire table theoretically and uh, find all of the entries uh, in which uh, uh, trade ID is equal to G1, right? So for example, if I wanted to extract, let's make it in yellow, right? So if I wanted to extract swap with trade ID G1, I would have to go and, um, uh, uh, I would have to go and get, uh, you know, these two legs from the entire table. And our little sample table in Excel in a diagram has four rows, but in reality, it could be a million rows, right? It could be hundred million rows. A large bank would have, uh, you know, up to a million of trades, uh, you know, sometimes more, and uh, you know, each trade uh, has multiple legs. So, you know, uh, that that's actually perhaps is not the uh, most uh, extreme example, right? So, there are some uh, situations in which you have billions of records uh, and uh, 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 you know, even more records, right? So, if you have to go through the entire table to find these two legs, it's not going to be very fast. So relational databases have sold this because they define an index, right? So they defined uh, essentially, uh, you know, a table within the database to make it possible to find, uh, that, you know, to find uh, leg records with a particular trade ID quickly. And uh, when you do the join, right? So you can just say that I want all of these legs for which the swap is, is uh, you know, that um, record. That's efficient. But join can do more than that, right? You can say that I want all legs for which the swap has some other attribute, right? So imagine that for the swap, there are more columns here. Like for example, some counterparty. I can say, you know, the real power of the join is that I can say, I want all legs for which the swap it refers to, right? So I want all legs for which this trade ID is for such swap that has some property here. There's a join. Okay, so now the problem with the join is that uh, the, um, uh, it, it works well for relational databases and it requires, and you know, there are ways around it, but you know, it works much better when there is a single server. And when you start getting independent servers, when you have a cluster or a sharded cluster, right? Joins start, uh, you know, become, become more difficult. And generally when you have web scale databases, uh, when you have a very large number of records, uh, basically you think like hundreds of billions of records, then joins gradually stop working. That's one issue with the joins uh, with relational design. Another issue with relational design uh, is that uh, is a proliferation of tables because imagine that it's not just a swap with the two legs, right? Imagine that you have something much deeper. Uh, we have a swap and then you have legs and you have cash flows and for your cash flows, you have also the index. So you are starting to get a lot of extra tables uh, and uh, each data type, instead of being one table uh, or you know, even sharing a table with some other data types, starts to uh, you know, get some uh, you know, very complex structure of tables. So the data becomes dispersed across multiple uh, tables because the standard way to, or, or the you know, most effective ways to use relational database, what's optimized for, is that you avoid arrays, you avoid complex documents inside the cell, right? You break everything into atomic values and when you take a complex tree of uh, you know basically like we imagine like a JSON document uh, you know a tree uh, that's the definition of something complex and start breaking it down into the stables uh, it becomes less efficient it's more difficult to query you also have to write the code to put it back together right so it's not that ideal. okay so uh, so, so far uh, uh, let me just ask for if there are questions so far and uh, then I'll uh, tell you about uh, you know what what how this led to the creation of a different database base type you mean NoSQL database all right so no. questions so far no questions no questions okay perfect all right so so the frustration with the need in relational database to create this complex schemas and complex uh, you know, functions, uh, you know, either complex code or complex stored procedures, which is basically a, a type of code that you save in a database and reuse, uh, led to the development of, uh, so frustration with that, led to the development of um, NoSQL databases. And there, the term is a little bit confusing because uh, most of the NoSQL databases actually support SQL, right? So in other words, uh, SQL is not the primary language for them or SQL or SQL, you know, I use uh, SQL. 
so standardized query language. So for some of these databases, uh, SQL is one of the languages that you use to access it. Uh, and uh, some of them actually, um, uh, uh, it, it, you know, for some of them it's a primary language and for others it's, uh, there's an alternative way to access the data, uh, but it, it is, uh, you know, a fully supported, uh, pretty effective way to access this data. So by saying NoSQL, it's really, you know, this means something else, right? It does not mean that they don't support SQL as a matter of principle. Okay, what it means is that uh, they are not relational uh, in the sense that uh, they don't have joints, right? So I think that more accurate way to call, uh, to, to, to specify what NoSQL database have in common, even though, again, there are a lot of databases that kind of sit in, in between several categories, right? They're, they're called multi-mode databases. But for the majority of NoSQL databases, what they have in common is that they don't attempt to optimize joints. Right, so I don't them to optimize joints in the sense that if I need all of the swaps for a particular counterparty, namely someone I'm trading with, right, so maybe like extra field uh, in here for the swap. So if I want to get all of the legs for the swap that has a particular property, that requires a join. And if the legs are stored in a separate table and the join, the join, uh, and join either does not work or is not efficient, I will have to go through a pretty elaborate process where I have to first the query the tab the table of the trades, then I create a list of this um, uh, uh, you know trade IDs, uh, then I'm going to query by a big list of trade IDs. So at the very least it will become less efficient. And above certain data sizes, it will become uh, just you know break down and stop working. For example, uh, one of the NoSQL databases that we'll talk about and use today, is a database that uh, Meta, or you know, formerly Facebook, uses to store, um, uh, or you know, at least previously used um, uh, to store, uh, you know, the content, right? So imagine uh, everybody in the world is posting to Facebook, uh, and uh, it has to all go, you know, somewhere. And then uh, when you log in, right, they should show your post. They should show, you know, whatever, whatever you know, your uh, friends are posting, uh, your likes, and so forth. So Facebook was looking for a database that had was called web scale, right? So web scale means it can handle hundreds of billions of records without slowing down and efficiently implement, you know, run queries on these records. And web scale with databases can only be achieved by, uh, and by the way, uh, uh, that's one example, uh, you know, but uh, I, I don't want you to think that, for example, if you work in finance, like we do, uh, that you don't need web scale databases. In finance, there is something else called tick data. Right, so tick data is uh, that every time anybody uh, wanted to buy or sell a stock anywhere in the world, right, that becomes a record, right. So that's a fire horse, uh, you know, just as good as Facebook, right, it's just just as uh, powerful, because uh, there are a lot of traders. There are even more, maybe a hundred times more, trading by electronic algorithms, essentially bots or programs that trade, and every time one of these bots you know, either executes a trade or there is something called third level data, which is if they place an order and even that, you know, does not result in a purchase, it still is a record, right? So in finance, uh, things like tick data or generally streaming market data also is essentially web scale, right? So it also has similar number of records and it has to be able to um, uh, add records very fast and query them very fast. So there are a lot of applications in which, uh, you know, you need web scale databases, right? Internet for things is another, right? So imagine all of the refrigerators uh, are reporting the data of milk uh, for everybody in the world, right? So that's gonna be a lot of records, right? And uh, all of the cars uh, are recording all of this data that, you know, basically smart cars, you know, are communicating and telling uh, each other where they're on the road and uh, where they're moving. So, uh, so web scale is something that in modern uh, interconnected world uh, is everywhere. Right, and not just for meta uh, or social media applications. And uh, relational databases just don't have the ability to scale up to that and still have joins, right? So what NoSQL databases do is that they give up joins and they gain all kinds of performance advantages. Uh, some of them, for example, uh, being able to do something called the sharded cluster where each request is routed to a particular you know, node of the cluster without having to hit the other clusters, right? When you're in advance, know uh, where your request will go. So in order to have web scale, you need to, to work without joins. And one way to work without joins is to do exactly the same relational design, 
but instead of joins, you just query by the list of IDs. In fact, um, uh, depending on how we're doing on time, even though I'm not uh, terribly optimistic right now, we may be able to do this exercise. Um, um, uh, it's not on uh, Git, so so we could do this exercise just um, uh, live, you know, as a uh, hands-on exercise. Uh, so I would do it in front of you, uh, but you know, it depends on how fast we'll be moving. All right. Uh, any, any additional questions? Yes, there is one. Okay, so let me stop and answer. Yeah, does NoSQL DB better choose for non-storing non-simple objects like arrays? Yes, yeah, that's an excellent question. Yes, that's exactly right, uh, and uh, I'm about to describe why. So, so NoSQL databases uh, are excellent for storing deeply hierarchical data or just anything that's not just a flat set of uh, fields. Uh, but also they have uh, other advantages uh, in performance, even if the data is relatively flat, right? But uh, one of the things I do is uh, make it easier to store hierarchical data. And that's exactly what we're going to dis discuss uh, uh, right now. All right, so that question leads me to the next uh, topic. Okay, so now let's look at the next item here, right? So, 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 th so this first, uh, uh, you know, this first approach here was relational database, right? Where um, you have a separate table for the leg and separate table for the trade. Okay, now let's look at document database, right? So document database is designed to store deeply hierarchical data while preserving certain features of relational database, uh, such as, for example, indexing uh, and efficient queries that are you know, held by indexing. However, document databases are specifically uh, not pursuing, you know, they, they make a deliberate decision not to pursue fast performance of joins such that they can focus on other things, uh, for example, uh, having unlimited scalability where you can scale, uh, you know, basically with more computing power, your performance grows without limit, right? Which for, for a relational database will not happen, right? So relational database is you start growing the table, there's a limit to how much uh, in end keep throwing computing power to the cluster. Eventually your inserts into the table will slow down. Because you will not be able to, um, uh, you will not be able to uh, uh, leverage uh, computing power to improve this. You know things are too interconnected. So for document databases, you are able to build them such that things are a lot more loosely connected, and each cluster node is separate. And this type of database scales a lot better. In, in other words, uh, you know if uh, uh, you know 100 million more people sign up for Facebook, uh, Meta is able to add more computing power and it still works just as fast as it did before, which is a feature that with relational database, it's very hard to achieve or impossible. All right, so, so the first type of document database that, um, that uh, you know, we'll talk about is NoSQL database, right? So it's, uh, uh, and with NoSQL database, with this particular problem that we have with the swap and the two legs, we can uh, solve it in uh, two ways, right? So one is the shallow style of embedding, and the other one is deep style of embedding. Okay, so the shallow style of embedding is called shallow. And by the way, the shallow deep is just the names I used. There is not really a standard uh, you know, way to denote them. But uh, the shallow way of embedding is when your hierarchical data is just one level deep. In other words, your, your definition of your record, for example, a trade or swap, you know, in this case, uh, it has fields which are arrays, right? So in other words, swap has two legs, but in our particular type of swap record, the leg does not have anything else inside this array. If it did have inside an array, for example, in real financial applications, there is something called cash flow, right? And cash flow is one payment over leg. If it had this one extra level of depth, right? So trade, um, I hope you see the video, right? Uh, no, it's not because I'm showing with my hands, right? So you have a trade, you have two legs, right? And then that's an array of legs, right? So the size of two. And by the way, some swaps have three legs, four legs and so forth, right? And then each leg just has scalar values, right? So it ends there. If it had even deeper hierarchy, right? If the, it was something that was just going further into the depth, the shallow approach would not work. So it only works when you have like one uh, level of depth. And in this case, what you can do is that you can make a record in which some fields are scalars, and some fields are arrays, right? I can even put like uh, square brackets here to indicate that this arrays, right? And uh, for the other method is uh, I'll put it here as well, but we're not talking about, we're not talking about it yet, <clears throat> excuse me, right? So uh, you have, 
in this case, trade ID, right? You have a swap. Uh, sorry, the trade ID is T1, type a swap. Then you have a type of the leg, which does not have a single value. It's in a list of values. And currency is also a list of values. And the order of these values is the same, right? So it's like uh, essentially a table, just like it's laid out in Excel here. So the first leg has fixed type and currency USD. Second leg has floating type and currency is Euro. So this, what I highlighted here, right? Let me highlight it in a different color, is one record. And this, I will highlight it in a different color, is a second, oh, sorry, is a second record. Let me just do the same type of coloring here, just so it's uh, uh, kind of more, you know, so we can uh, uh, see the correspondence of one with the other, right? So this is the first record, and this is the second record. So here, one record is a single. So see here is a single quote unquote row, right? But in this row, we can have an array. Okay. So now that's not going to work when these fields are also no scalar, right? Because uh, in this case, uh, uh, we would, um, you know, because it's an array essentially of, uh, of um, uh, atomic types, right? So it, and it has only one dimension. So for that, there is a second way to do it uh, with um, uh, document databases like Mongo. And the second way to do it is to embed a list of documents, right? So um, uh, a document is just a hierarchical data structure. Uh, in uh, you know document databases, right? So think again. So think a JSON uh, file, and uh, or a tree, right? Tree of values. And uh, one second, just uh, like right. So so the difference between these two. And uh, by the way, if it's difficult to catch right now, we're just about to go into code. I just wanted to go through all these options, right? So we're going to review all of them again through the code, and uh, it will become uh, more evident. Let's so, please. Alexander, let's answer two questions before going to code. I think it oh, will okay. be yeah, more relevant. Yeah, yeah, okay, right. All right, so let me see. Okay, so a lot of questions, right? Wow, okay. Floodgates have opened. Okay, that's fine, right? We can use array in SQL. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so, so let me just answer in sequence. Yeah, so all of them very good questions. Okay, first, uh, no SQL DB, I better choose. Okay, so I already answered that one, right? But we can use array in SQL. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, and I actually said I said that right. So so as I mentioned earlier, relational databases, modern relational databases, not the ones uh, you know 20, 30 years ago, but modern relational databases can store JSON, right? So and can store arrays, right? So Postgres can store arrays and can store JSON. Oracle can do the same. Uh, this commercial database. Okay, so let's talk about open source, right? So it, almost every modern open source um, uh, database. Uh, can uh, maybe with the exception of really lightweight ones like SQL Lite, right? Uh, even though I, I didn't, I didn't check it. Perhaps it can also. But uh, things like you know databases like MySQL, Postgres, uh, and of course uh, uh, you know the commercial databases, relational databases are able to store arrays and documents in the cell. And in the sense, they are trying to become document databases. Now the thing is, uh, they don't do it as well as document databases that are designed from the ground up to be document databases, right? So when you're trying to use arrays in Postgres and your table becomes very large, you actually discover also, uh, you know, that it's not as good as a native document database. In particular, in Postgres, when you put something large in a table above a certain size, it stores it offline, right? So in other words, there is a storage in the Postgres engine allocated for the record and anything big is stored somewhere else. So Postgres has to go uh, find a pointer, right? Then go somewhere else and find uh, that record. So you can, and in fact, uh, you know, as an exercise, you know, can actually implement in Postgres whatever I'm going to do with Mongo, which is a native document database. Uh, but uh, you know, the the basically, uh, you know, we're not here. You know, the other thing I wanted to say about this, we're not here talking about any particular database brand or you know or, 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 or type. Right, we're talking about styles of how you can store the data and what kind of objects in Python you need to build to store them, which is what I'm about to go to. So uh, Postgres can pretend to be the document database and can do it quite well, but not as well as you know, uh, native document database. 
Exactly. And then somebody says can, but not designed for it. Perfect. Exactly. So somebody actually already answered for me, and that's exactly the right answer. I may give you a longer answer. NoSQL use JSON to store data, so it could be something else. Okay, so NoSQL um, does not use JSON to store data. Each database uses its own uh, binary type. For example, uh, Postgres uses JSONB to store documents. Uh, uh, Mongo uses Bison, which is a different way to store JSON in a binary way. So there are two alternative uh, standards. Uh, and generally, um, uh, JSON is uh, not always the, well, never the way the database stores the data inside, because it's a string format. It's not effective, right? It would uh, this database would use more storage than a data that uses binary, right? But JSON is the standard way to send hierarchical data to the database when you don't care about the schema. When you do care about the schema, you can use. Oh, sorry, correction. When you send JSON, you should use JSON schema, but the document object mapping and uh, sorry, object document mapping and relational um, and object relational mapping that uh, we'll talk about in a moment is actually a better way or, or a alternative way, right? I believe it's a better way. Yeah, so Mongo is based on. Okay, so I already answered that. Uh, okay, so next one, MongoDB supports JSON, BSON, and, BSON and XML. That's absolutely correct comment, but not a question. Uh, where's like ID lost in NoSQL? Aha, okay, excellent question. Let me, let me just answer it in a second, then we go through the rest of questions, uh, right? Yeah, okay, so why is the uh, uh, leg ID lost in NoSQL? Okay, that's an excellent question. Let me answer that one, right? Leg ID is lost in NoSQL because uh, remember just a, you know, a few minutes ago, I was talking about parent and child and both parent and child are persons. And person, a child, is not only child of a parent, right? Person is a, you know, child is a person in their own right. So they need their own ID because uh, maybe they could get a password or something, right? However, leg has no meaning outside the swap. So the reason in uh, NoSQL there is no leg ID is because leg has no meaning outside the swap, right? So in other words, uh, you don't need to find it separately in a table, it's embedded. Right, and that's where leg ID disappeared. In fact, in this type of database, there is not even, uh, well, you know, you can make a column, I guess, for it, right? So I was, I was about to say there's no place to put it. You can make a separate column for it, right? And here you don't need it, right? So in neither of these two, you need it because legs have no purpose outside the swap. Uh, they have no life of their own. And once they are inside the swap, you don't need the ID, right? Because they're already in there. You just enumerate like first leg, second leg, right? So their ID becomes just a, a index of the leg in the array. And that's why you don't need it. So, uh, so you don't need it here. Okay, so it's again, so the difference here is that one is that uh, when you have array of legs, you make an array of each leg attribute and put that as a separate column in the record. The other one is that you make a single column, right? And that's a deep style of embedding. You make a single column, in which there is array of documents and each document has like type and like currency. And uh, then there are uh, basically two of these documents here. And the reason this is called deep is because if there is another layer called cache flow, right? Then we will be able to embed it here because this document in there, right? So it's array of legs, each leg is a document and it can have array of cache flows and so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas here we're stuck, right? Because we committed to this being an array of atomic values like string or floating number or integer. And if there is any deeper data, we cannot uh, use it. So, so shallow means it's only good for one level, uh, you know, one, one um, uh, level of hierarchy deep. And this is good for any levels of hierarchy. So when you have something deeply hierarchical, you go for that. And when you don't, you have a choice between these two, but that one is usually more efficient because there is less kind of a, you know, deep, there's less of a uh, data other than, uh, there's less of a helper uh, kind of structured information stored in the database. And let me just uh, mention one other database type. It's not as popular as this tool. And uh, I'm not going to, um, uh, you know, just given the time, I was not going to show it uh, as an example, right? But, um, but uh, you know, I wanted to mention, right? There is something called white column store. And this white column store, white column database, uh, so it's also NoSQL, and uh, the leading open source database for that is called Cassandra, right? So Cassandra, uh, what they do is that it's a database in which you can have groups of columns, which you can query together, right? So you have a leg type and index one, leg type index two. So essentially what it does is that it flattens the data. And by the way, you can do it also with relational database, right? So in other words, uh, uh, this 
table type of table you don't have to um, uh, you don't have to uh, use um, uh, especially when the number of flags is fixed it's always two right you don't have to have a cassandra or no sql database to do that right you can do it also with postgres or mysql or sql light but the issue here is that in Cassandra, there is a special database feature to group together columns of a similar type. So this white column table, essentially it's, you can think of it as almost like this, except instead of vertical as being horizontal, right? So in other words, the way that Cassandra works is very similar to this type of storage because columns of the same kind could be indexed, grouped together and queried together and aggregated together. Normal relational database does not have that. So if you have a swap with two legs and the next swap has three legs, right? So then that, that's where you get um, uh, in trouble because then with Cassandra, your query is still reasonably looking. With document database, it's uh, perfectly fine. With relational database, it's also perfectly fine. But if you do that in Postgres, then your query becomes really ugly and you have to have if two legs do that, if three legs do this and so forth. All right, so uh, I went in great detail through this ways to pack a very simple data. So uh, let me just ask for a final set of questions before we actually go into the code. This uh, has been actually probably the longest introduction. That's exactly what I was trying to avoid, but I guess um, uh, you know the, uh, the uh, um, uh, Excel uh, database diagram is much better than slides because um, uh, you know it's um, essentially exactly how the objects are going to lay laid out. And uh, we're going to go very quickly through the objects because for each object, there will be a table which looks exactly like that object. All right, any questions before I go into the uh, code? Not yet, please proceed. Okay. Great, all right, we'll have a lot just now, right? Okay, so now let's take a look here. So uh, so, we, so I created uh, in the uh, project, and by the way, after the course, uh, it will be, uh, I already pushed something to GitHub, but um, you know, I, 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 I will finalize it. So basically if you're using it, you know, please note it will be finalized after the course, right? So, uh, so with, you know, benefit of feedback, uh, but there's already something on GitHub. So let's take a look here. So um, uh, the, data types that uh, we have are in the um, uh, uh, the data types that we have are in the uh, folder schema in core and each of these classes has a prefix right so deep for the deep nosql then shallow for the shallow nosql right so, so deep swap let me just close everything one second Little taps, right so deep for the nosql deep packing uh, using Mongo database, uh, shallow using the same database, but using the shallow style of packing. Then uh, I used Mongo to pack white because I did not want to have another yet another uh, object, um, you know, document mapping layer and um, database adapter. So I, so I used Mongo to pack the uh, data schema that's really, you know, is more suitable for Cassandra. Uh, and uh, finally, relational, I use SQL Alchemy to uh, pack it, which is here. Okay, so uh, let me go in the opposite order to what um, uh, to what um, uh, we went through here, because toward the end actually gets simpler, right? And uh, the first one with the two separate tables is the more, most complex one. So let's look at first of all at the white, uh, <coughs> sorry, white uh, style definition, right? First of all, uh, with that we're coming to you know the practices of how to represent this um, uh, objects and data and uh, that was something that was not an excel table so the first thing that i wanted to um, uh, i wanted to highlight is that uh, you should have a class first of all you know generally object document mapping object relational mapping the approach uh, there is for every table to have a class and for every record on the table you have an object you have uh, the uh, you populate the object with data and push it to the database then when you do a query it returns you you know a bunch of objects and when you do that with one of the object frameworks which provides safety like for example object that uses slots uh, or you know even if you don't use slots still the linter you know hopefully will uh, tell you if you're making a mistake it gives you a structure 
so you know that gives you a lot more safety of working with complex data when you have a lot of data types compared to just a bag of uh, you know essentially a dictionary a hierarchical dictionary which is mapped to json so we have a trade class right so we have a swap class right but we can also introduce hierarchy that makes sense in the objects which then will translate to how the data database works so let's look at white swap right that's conceptually the simplest one uh we're now going in opposite order, right? From simple to complex. So here, there's only one table, right? In each table has, you know, because, uh, you know, if you look here, right, here's our two tables. And the next uh, two are tables with hierarchical data. So the Cassandra style is white column, you know, for white column database. And this design is actually called uh, mile wide table, right? So when you hear, uh, you know, in the engineering meeting, uh, when you get a drop in the engineering meeting, you hear, well, it's a mile wide table. That's a called mile wide table, right? Table, which is as wide as one mile, maybe it's two miles, right? So, um, so basically it's when you take a hierarchical object and unpack it such that it's all flat. So uh, there are some database types like streaming databases in which the data is coming from the firehose extremely fast where this is actually more or less the only thing you can do, right? Because they don't have joints, you know, the, the, the data is so vast and the speed, you know, these, these are the database that's used by high frequency traders, whose basically main concern is how to beat the speed of light, right? So they, these are the people who complain about uh, speed of light from Chicago to New York uh, taking six microseconds. And that uh, means that some uh, server in Chicago would beat their server in New York uh, for the trade, right? Because it's six, six microseconds late due to the speed of light. So uh, these databases, they're only mile wide. They don't have joints, they don't have hierarchies, they don't have anything. All they can do is to just flatten the data, right? Uh, and uh, when this flattened data structure, uh, everything is extremely simple, right? So you have everything flat, you have trade type, leg type like for first leg and second leg and uh, uh and and the um, uh so two types and two currencies uh this type corresponds to this currency this type corresponds to that currency so i'm going to replicate this here so we create an object called white swap right so we swap back to the white mile white table with this two types and two currencies and you may notice that I'm using what you know I've warned, right? So <laughs> each of this uh, database adapters uses its own uh, uh, you know data framework. So I'm using object document mapping uh, layer, which is called Mongo Engine, which is built uh, on top of PyMongo, and um, I believe uh, and um, actually uh, I'll double check it. I think it's PyMongo, but maybe just to see Mongo driver. Uh, but uh, basically, this is the you know the standard. There, there is something called the PyMongoose, but it has only a few forks and a few likes. So this is the Mongo engine is the leading uh, object document mapper for Mongo database. So it has its own kind of address style or data class style um, uh, data class style. Um, uh, uh you know uh, type of defining the objects because we're very familiar with all of them this will not surprise or scare us right so uh instead of putting you know multiple places this leg like attributes which is doing it in one place and instead of a decorator they want you to derive from the class i'll show you in a moment uh, with this uh, root classes right but essentially what you do is that you say munga engine dot string field it's a field or column or attribute in case of Python uh, that has a max length of 50. That's a good default when you know how long it is, but it's not very long, right? And uh, here, currency is always three uh, uh, three uh, character symbols, so we limit it to three, right? So, so we defined a class in which there are four string fields and uh, two for the leg type and two for the uh, for the currency. Yeah, now you notice that there is no trade ID, there is no trade type. And the reason is because I introduced a base class, right? So in Python, like in C++, uh, Java or C Sharp, you can use class hierarchies. And some of the database adapters, not all, make it very easy for you to work with these hierarchies, right? So um, uh, the, uh, one second, so, so we go to declaration of uh, trade, uh, trade, key, trade key, right? Sorry, of trade. So we have swap. Which is defined derived from. Uh, let me just see if I can uh, do. Um, there was somewhere here, I think. Um, diagram creator. Diagrams. Okay. Well, you know what? Somebody asked me if um, 
uh, somebody somebody asked me like why was it worth getting a professional pie charm and i said i cannot remember the difference okay so here's one right so it's not why i got it uh, but uh, this diagram is something i only in professional so anyway so uh this is the white swap is derived from white trade and is derived from white trade key and that is derived from Mongo engine document okay so uh Mongo engine document is the base class that does all of this magic magic that utters data class and so forth achieved to the decorator. In fact, uh, you know, they work exactly the same way. Uh, you just specify them differently. So you specify this as base. Okay, so then you have the white trade key, right? And uh, I think I can open from here. Let me see. I can open it from to source, right? So uh, this is the key class, right? In most of the tutorials on object document or object relational mapping, you just have the table. Right? I found it very beneficial to actually create the key class and then derive the table, the record class from it. So the key class is the one that has primary keys, right? So our primary key, and again, you know, you studied, uh, I assume, uh, database uh, design, right? So primary key is the, uh, let's assume it's one, right? So that's a unique identifier of the record. So there can't be two records in a database with the same primary key. So the object which has some name and has a suffix key is the one that uh, is convenient to create with only the primary keys. Because if you uh, don't want the record, but you just want the collection of primary keys, and in a lot of cases, it's more than one, and sometimes you just don't, don't know which field, right? So this gives you the ability to essentially to pass it as a reference, right? So if you have a reference to the object, so the, the, the instance of a class primary key when you populate that fields will uniquely identify the record itself in the database. So I'm making it a base, right? And what this, what this thing does is first of all, it says DB alias. Uh, and uh, you know that's just because um, I, I wanted all of the unit tests to run in parallel. And if you open multiple SQLite connections, that's, uh, that's the, um, uh, sorry, if you open multiple Mongo engine connections, uh, then you know it tells you that, uh, that you cannot, um, simultaneously work with several. So, so DB alias is just a way to name the connections so they're separate. In allow inheritance is what makes it possible to produce derived types. So the primary key is here. Then when you go back, uh, let me just go back to the diagram. Uh, so when you go here, um, uh, jump to source, right? So trait is derived from trait key and that's trait type. That's the field common to all traits, not just swaps. So swap is a trade, right? It's something you can say a contract you can sign with others or something you can buy. So trade type is not a primary key, but it's common to all trades. And now we only have the, um, uh, the uh, last uh, you know, element that we already looked at, right? Which is the swap. So swap has attributes that are specific to the swap and don't occur for every trait. Trait has attributes which occur to the for every trait, except the primary key, and the trait key, which is the base class of trait, has the primary key, and that is derived from from um, uh, Mongo engine document. So we have a three level deep here here now, and we're able to get swaps, traits, all traits, only swaps from a database or uh, we can get the um, uh, we can get the uh, um, <clears throat> uh, 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 key object which is basically a pointer that uniquely identifies the record okay now let's go to the uh, test now so the tests are also here in schema and uh, one second so I don't know it was refactor okay and uh, let's go to the test right so and uh, before i actually execute the test let me just show a couple of things on how to work with uh, testing the databases okay so first of all uh, when you're testing uh, databases you don't want to run new tests on a database that may have some garbage because if the database already exists and you test run and you test recorded five records wrote five records Second time you run a test, there will be 10 records and then 15 records, right? So the rest of your test will not work correctly because there will be some extra records that existed there, but they wouldn't exist if that's for the first time you're running. it. So what you wanna do is that first thing you wanna do is, is uh, and we should um, show the test, right? So that's a test function. So first you connect to a database. 
each uh, driver or you know framework has a different way to do it uh, and uh, you know this is for mongo engine it's like sql alchemy which is the object relational mapping we'll look at uh, has a slightly different way okay and then cleanup right so what's what's a cleanup uh, function do, does a cleanup function uh, drops the database right so basically it deletes the database and we call cleanup function twice right first time we call it um uh, where's the test one second let's just close the others right so first one time we call it and not that we call it twice right first time we call it to drop the database in cases left over from the previous test right so imagine i run a test maybe there was an error i stopped right and i did not have the opportunity to clean up right so we cannot trust the database to be pristine we cannot trust that nobody uh, you know wrote something in the table uh, or in the database so the only safe way to do it is not even a table right because some tests actually access multiple tables and some test for something else if i'm testing something for the leg test for the swap may touch the leg and write some legs so first thing we want to do is to write a test so it works with a separate database not a separate table separate database it also will scale better in, in the cloud, right? Because if it's a separate database, because then you can create it in a separate server and all of the tests can run in parallel. So each test runs in a separate database and cleans it twice before it starts and after it ends. Why the first time? Because if something happened in the second one, the last one, right? So in other words, if test didn't run to the end and failed to clean up, then you clean up in the beginning. So there is a cleanup here and a cleanup at the end. Okay, now that's how you want to run it in production, right? So, so I'm going to run it. Uh, and uh, you'll see that my server is empty, right? And in order to work with Mongo, there is an open source. Uh, so Mongo, by the way, is open source, right? So so, so we're only using, for this course, as a matter of policy, we're only using um, uh, open source software or software with community editions, right? So uh, uh, so uh, the uh, uh, software that has, uh, you know, my, my PyCharm is not a community, but there is a community edition. So uh, the, for the databases, uh, for the database, uh, for the Mongo database, uh, we're using DB Compacts, which is free and comes with uh, Mongo database. And uh, I'm going to connect, uh, actually I already connected and you know, reload the data. Uh, so uh, basically that's the databases for administration and there are no other databases. Okay, so now in order to, for us to actually see what's going on, I'm going to disable that second cleanup, right? And run it again. Okay, and now after I uh, reload the data, we'll see how the records are stored, right? So first of all, those of you who are used to, um, uh, those of you who are used to kind of, a, you know, SQL browsers, which basically show each record horizontal, well, that one shows vertical by default because it's, it's essentially like JSON, right? And there are actually, there's also a table view here, right? So you can look at it here like that. You can look at it like JSON. You can look at it as a tree, right? So I like looking at it as JSON because I think it's more clear, right? So this thing is the unique object ID that MongoDB always creates. Please don't pay attention to that, right? So this is the, uh, with underscore, is a, a, a technical, uh, well, not technical, but you know, basically, it's a it's a record that object document mapper uses to figure out what class, right? And it shows the whole here here, well, trade key, trade and swap, right? A little ugly, but you know, it tells it's the here here, right? And uh, then there's trade ID, trade type, leg type one, leg type two, like currency one, currency two, and so forth. Okay, so now uh, we can. Um, uh, using the um, uh, uh, using the uh, uh, Mongo driver, and uh, given the time, uh, I'm probably going to show uh, some more advanced types of queries together uh, with lecture four, because uh, in fact, um, uh, you know, a lot of what we'll be doing there um, uh, will be also based on uh, basically these objects, and uh, we'll be working with the same type of databases. So uh, this example here. Uh, creates sample swaps, but also it creates sample bonds. Okay, so bonds is a different type of trade. We didn't talk about it before, it was not in Excel. But bond is a type of record, which is also derived from the trade. And it has something called bond currencies, right? So bond does not have two legs, it only has one leg. 
right? So only one bond owner is receiving interest from someone, but not paying any interest. So bond has one leg and the currency of that leg, the currency of the payment is in the bond record. So now we have a hierarchy that is a class hierarchy, right? So you may be more familiar with it from C++, but then Python also, you know, when you're developing software properly, you should really use, uh, basically Python is an object, first class object oriented language. Uh, and uh, you want to use uh, objects and classes and hierarchies. So you have a trait and it has fields which come to all traits. Then there's a swap, which is a particular kind of trait. And it has fields specific to the swap, like the legs. But also there's a bond, which is a different kind of trait. And it has fields specific to the bond. So here we created um, the, um, uh, so we created here the, uh, um, uh, two swap records here. It's just creating basically a random sample with uh, dummy data. One bond sample, it's an array, but it only has one element. In I return, everybody I assume knows what it is, right? You have two lists, you put plus, you just can concatenate the list. It's a Pythonic, Pythonic way of doing it. If you do append, people who are really good at Python and say, uh, you know, they don't know about the plus. All right, so, uh, so that's kind of a, you know, the elegant way to do it. It's considered to be elegant in Python, right? But it's really just a pen. So uh, we recorded, we created this list of records here. Let me just step it through the debugger. Okay, so so we created this uh, records here, right? So let me just step, step over. Right, and uh, uh, this uh, records, right, if you hit plus, right, it has swap, another swap, and the bond, right? So two swaps, one bond. It's a record in memory. And then I wrote, uh, I send them all to, um, to a database. Actually, uh, the reason I'm sending them one by one is not a good reason in Mongo engine. In uh, SQL Alchemy working with SQLite, uh, I wasn't able to find at least, uh, you know, immediately a way to do bulk insert, right? So in Mongo, of course, there is uh, one, uh, but I just made it more explicit so I can step it uh, through it with the debugger. So we inserted the records, right? So now the records are inserted. And now how do we access the records? Well, it's very easy because uh, with a Mongo engine, you go for swap in white trade objects, print swap trade ID, right? So let's see what it prints. How many will it print? Who thinks it will print two IDs? Raise your hand. Who thinks it will do three? There's one. There's one. Mm -hmm. one. Okay. All right, and that's correct, right? Because uh, I, I called the swap, but it's really the trade, right? So, so there was actually a bug here, uh, which has no consequence on the, what the program does, right? So it should be a trade. So I just named the variable wrong, right? So because it says what trade object, so it will press three because we're doing all trades, right? So, so let's, let's just uh, make sure. So three is correct, right? Despite my mistake um, in uh, in ID. And now, so, so, so you see what we're doing here is that uh, we first doing trade objects, right? And now we're going swap objects. So what this does is that it does all of the trades, right? We should expect three. And then you go swap objects, right? Well, a bond does not have the right fields for the swap. It has a field that the swap does not have, bond currency, and it has lags the legs. So when you do this, right, when you specify a derived type here, it will skip all of the ones that are not uh, parents of the type or the type itself. So there will be three here and two here. So let's just uh, stop the, uh, you know, stop it and uh, run again. And as you can see here, it says all trades three, right? T1, T2, T3, the other one T1, right? Okay, so, and now you see that T3 is in front of T1 and T2, why is that? Well, just because Mongo in his great wisdom decided to uh, record the bonds before the swaps, uh, has to do probably with something with optimization. And there is a way to sort it, which uh, we'll talk about in the next lecture, you know, it's a bit more what you can do with this API. So you can sort it uh, by any field and so forth. And there's something called the index, uh, which accelerates the sorting. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, you know, we have this database, which is white. Okay, so now let's look, um, given that we are kind of short on time a little bit. Um, so so uh, I'm going to finish the, ways to write data into the database for all of the four types of mapping. Three of them being Mongo engine and one of them being SQL Alchemy. And then uh, for the next lecture, uh, we're going to show how to use queries. Uh, and then we'll show how to implement REST interfaces using these queries. So, so we'll use the queries uh, to implement REST. This is the final lecture of the course on Wednesday. All right, so uh, now let's go to shallow, right? Because shallow is kind of a little bit more um, 
uh, uh, more um, similar to white, right? So with the shallow, uh, instead of two columns for leg type and two columns for the currency, we have an array. Okay, so how does it look? Uh, it looks very similar, right? So you have a shallow trade key, which looks exactly the same. You have shallow trade, which looks exactly the same. You have shallow swap, you have the shallow, shallow, shallow bond, which looks exactly the same, right? Because it has scalar field anyway, so there's no difference. But for the swap, we have a list, right? And in Mongo engine, you specify it as list field of string field. If this was utters, right? If this was utters, I would do this. So in utters, I would do that. It's complaining because I didn't import uh, that. But that's not how this works, right? So unfortunately, all of these frameworks basically use different style of definition. They all define the same thing. They just all do it differently because data classes were not part of Python when this library was created, right? So it had to do their own thing. They are gr gradually converging to, toward using data class for everything. So uh, leg type is a list of strings. Leg currency is a list of strings. Okay, and uh, our test looks almost exactly the same. Right, so connect, clean up, same database driver. Uh, here we're creating a list of legs, and for the bond we are doing the same thing as before. And here we again uh, have exactly the same thing uh, with basically uh, two swap records, one bond record. So let's run it. Oh, what happened? Uh, okay, so shallow code test. What did I do here? It looks like I broke something accidentally. We should take a look. Okay, so that's not what I broke. Aha, okay, so you see, I forgot, um, I, I didn't undo my change completely. So, so I didn't like the syntax, sorry. Uh, when I was showing the, uh, um, uh, probably easier just to undo it and get. By the way, that's a very vivid demonstration why you should always commit like very, very, very often because then all you have to do is like that, right? Discard and we're good to go, right? So if you notice, uh, you know, and the, the, some of it is on GitHub and all of it, the rest of it will be GitHub. I am doing tiny changes here and committing, right? Because first of all, merge works much better if you do that. And second is that if you break something, you don't have to basically re restore the last two hours of your work. So uh, now it's supposed to run a little bit better. Okay, it did, right? And also we have uh, three uh, trades, uh, two swaps, right? But, uh, oh, by sorry. And of course I forgot to undo the uh, cleanup, right? So, so I need to run it again because it deleted the database that I was going to look at. All right, that should be better, right? I'm going to reload the data. Okay, and now we have wide and shallow, right? So shallow looks a little bit different. Okay, so again, so we can look at the JSON, we can look at this table. Okay, so we look at this as a table, right? You can expand it here. And uh, well, this is probably the best viewer for that, right? So so you can look as a, as a tree, right? So uh, the leg column has two elements. The currency column has two elements. Uh, in JSON, also leg column has two elements. So basically, these are both arrays. So that's a shallow style, right? And it completely corresponds how the object is uh, looking. And again, you could actually create JSON this way, right? And write it to the database, but you lose the type safety because nobody will tell you if there is a field of that name at that, at that level, right? And linter will not tell you, the runtime checker will not tell you. So object document and object relational mapper become increasingly important as your schema becomes more complex for the enterprise Python project. Because they warn you when you are using the wrong field, you're using the uh, you know the field at the wrong level, right, or, or for the wrong object. Okay, now let's go to deep, right? So for the, for deep, uh, that's the test, and uh, these are the objects in a separate folder. So again, trade key, same thing. Trade, same thing. Bond, same thing. Not nothing different about it. Okay, now we have a separate object for the leg. Right, so we create a deep leg. You notice that trade key was derived from Mongo engine, right? So Mongo engine is ME document. Leg is derived from Mongo engine embedded document, right? 
So there is a separate route you have to, you, you have to derive it from something, but it's not the document. Document is an independent record. And in the swap, you now say list field, embedded document field, dplag. So that's how in, uh, in um, um, uh, that's how in uh, uh, Moon Engine you specify that. Let me just show it how to specify it for address or the data class. For address or the data class, I would do this. List deep leg equal none. So shorter, more elegant, says the same thing. It's a list of deep leg, right? So, uh, and hopefully we'll avoid you know, making the same mistake here. Uh, so that's how it, it works in Mongo engine. Well, that's the way that uh, they decided to do it. All right, so, um, well, you know, be before data class uh, had their way. And, and actually, uh, one thing to be fair, right? It was before type annotations. So in fact, uh, they could not have done it, right? Because type annotations, I think, did not exist when the first uh, version of that library came out. So they couldn't have used it uh, this more elegant way. All right, so deep court test, let's run it. And, oh, sorry, one second. Uh, we need to disable the deletion of the database. Uh, but we're still safe running it multiple times because we clean up in the beginning. Okay, so reloading the data in Mongo Compass. Okay, so uh, now we have a single array for legs, each has objects. So one leg here and one leg here. Okay, so it definitely looks a lot more compact and kind of logical, right? So you can see that the fields of the leg are, are together, of the second leg are also together, right? Also in JSON, you can, you know, basically it looks uh, kind of more elegant, uh, uh, more, more, more logical and more kind of easier to understand, right? However, if there is only one level deep, it's actually slower because uh, for JSON or for Bzone or for JSONB, creating embedded dictionary is actually slower than creating an array of uh, atomic values because array of atomic values, you can allocate a specific size. Uh, well, actually not for the string, right? Unless you specify the size, but for things like uh, dates and flows and so forth. So uh, it's not as performant. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, for the API, it's actually more complicated, but uh, the, most, the, the main reason for the existence of that type of schema is that if there are more levels of hierarchy into some sub objects of the leg, you can add it indefinitely in most of your work, right? Okay, so uh, with that, uh, there's one final, uh, and you know, well, we started uh, five minutes, uh, we waited five minutes uh, until everybody joins. So, you know, we have five minutes to go, so we're good, right? One last type of uh, packing, right? And for that, we're going to use a different object, uh, uh, you know, uh, object relational mapping in this case, right? The different object framework, yet another one, right? And that's the uh, SQL alchemy. So SQL alchemy, just like um, uh, Mongo engine is not the only object document mapping, SQL alchemy is not the only really object relational mapping. One of the object relational mapping uh, types that are popular is within Django. And Django is the framework for building uh, web services and web applications in Python. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, lecture four, we'll be talking about building REST APIs. So PyDancing is using fast API. Django is using, um, uh, you know, its own object uh, relational mapping. We use SQL Alchemy. And for the SQL database, we use SQL Lite, right? So we're not trying to get Mongo to pretend to be a relational database, and it's not because it does not have joins uh, that we'll need in the next lecture. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll need to now switch to this different um, uh, API. So uh, I'll be very brief, right? Uh, it's all very similar. Again, it will not scare us because we've seen already many of those. So first of all, you have this declarative base, which is returned by, the, um, by this function, right? In Python, as we all know, a function can return a class as opposed to, you know, just, so it's a basically functional programming language. It can return a class or function as opposed to, you know, not just data. So base is returned by this declarative base in SQL Alchemy. Then you derive from it and you have to specify table name. It will not do it for you, right? Then you have a real trait, again, same thing, but you have column, right? So you use slightly different syntax. Here is a column of string. Swap has no fields. Why does it have no fields, right? It has no fields. Here also has no fields, right? Because the leg is separate. And 
like in basically this type of a one-to-many relational design, key distinction in all other data types, and actually you can also do it this way in relational database, but it's not you know the way that it's normally done. It's not that the swap knows about the leg, it's the leg knows about the swap, right? So so the direction is opposite. You can actually make it also bi bi-directional. You know, I could talk for 90 minutes just about SQL alchemy and uh, what it does. Um, so, but that's not the topic of the course, right? So we're just going to be brief. But essentially the key difference here is that in all of these types of packing, swap knows about the leg. And in fact, the leg is inside the swap. Sometimes it's not even a separate object, right? Here's a separate object, but embedded. Here is the other way around. Swap does not know about its legs. It have to look for them by query, right? It's the leg that knows about the swap, right? Okay, so uh, we have a, a relational leg key, right? Because it's a separate object that has its own key. We have a leg object. We have the bond object, which is derived from trade. And we have a swap object, which is also derived from trade, but has no fields. If swap had any scalar fields in our schema, they would be here. Okay, so now how does that work? Okay, so it works in a very similar way. Uh, and uh, one second, so let me just go relational, right? So uh, so and, uh, let me just again disable, oh, okay, so cleanup is already disabled here, right? So syntax is a little bit different, right? So instead of a connection, you get engine, uh, and from engine, you get engine connect and you get connection. Uh, you have the, uh, here again, for Postgres, there is a bulk insert for SQLite. I wasn't able to find one. And of course, SQLite is an embedded database that basically works in memory or in the file. So there is no server that I installed. By the way, for this Mongo, I had to install the open source Mongo database and Compass to work with it. Uh, so SQLite is just a file and the database is in the file. So it's a serverless database. Furthermore, in SQL Alchemy, you actually have to kind of duplicate the definition, unfortunately. Um, uh, I, I think that there may be a way to avoid it. So, you know, by lecture four, it'll, um, uh, I'll research a little bit more, but I was not able to find it quickly how to avoid this uh, duplication. So, uh, and uh, with that, let's just run it and, uh, you know, see what, see what it does. Uh, so first of all, let me just make sure that I don't actually have already the database, I don't, okay, good. Okay, so I run it, yes, now, uh, this is not in Mongo, right? So we will not find it here. It's not a Mongo database, it's SQL, uh, SQL Lite. And SQL Lite is a, uh, oh, sorry, so, uh, the selectors. Uh, and uh, SQL Lite is, works with, um, sorry, uh, works with uh, files. And we can see this file. So let's reveal it and explore. Okay, so this is the file in which the database is. Right, it's a serverless database. It reads and writes from files. It's basically mostly work used for like embedded um, uh, embedded databases and applications for storing settings and so forth. So uh, how do we read it? Okay, well, uh, you know, there are various readers. Uh, most of them are commercial, but uh, one way to read it uh, is to um, go to SQLite Viewer. And SQLite Viewer is on GitHub, right? It's free. And uh, the SQLite viewer, basically it's, it's just JavaScript that works on your computer. I don't believe it's sending any, well, it, it better, right? So they, they claim they do not send any, they will collect any data on the server. So I definitely would not, um, basically uh, if you're going to drag and drop a database with uh, your crypto wallet keys, uh, I take no responsibility for the consequences because maybe they uh, do upload the data to the server, but I believe it just runs uh, in JavaScript in the browser. So the way that you use it, you simply drop the database here, right? And uh, once you do that, you'll be able to see this. So that gives us quote unquote, uh, you know, basically equivalent of compact so database compass or database browser. It shows us the query that it executed to get this table, right? And as you can see, there is a swap, there is a trade and uh, there's a trade ID, trade type and bond currency. Bond currency is null for the swaps, right? So, so it only present for the bond. So we have two swap records, one bond record. And for the swap, Swap does not know about the leg. To find out about the leg, it has to run a query on the leg, right? That's how one-to-many is implemented in relational databases uh, normally, even though, again, you can do it that way, but if you do it that way, then you have to store an array of legs in the cell, right? Because there's one swap and there are multiple legs. If swap knows about the legs, then we're back to our original problem where we have to store an array of leg IDs. We can do it, but relational databases are not optimized for it. If we have one to many, one swap, many legs, and leg knows about the swap, it only has to know about one swap, which swap, the one it belongs to, there's only one. 
So if leg knows about the swap, we can use it as scalar field. And we're trying to build relational tables with the scalar field. So that's why it works the other way. So the leg has leg ID, it has trade ID, it has leg type and leg currency. We've seen it before. So these first two belong to trade ID, right? So as I can say, you know, select, uh, so, you know, I can say where trade ID equal to something, right? So it's like a currency equal. If I do where trade ID is equal to T1 and T2, you know, it's gonna basically execute um, uh, and show me only the legs for, for a given swap. So there are two tables here, trade, which has swap and bond, in leg is a separate table. Okay, so with that, let me ask for the final answer, the final set of questions, because we're a little bit late. Uh, and um, uh, after that, uh, we'll continue with queries uh, uh, in the next um, uh, in the next lecture. Okay, so uh, OGM is abbreviation for. Um, I'm answering them. Um, one second. So okay. Ah, okay. Right. Green. Okay. Thought, uh, thank you. Okay. So thank you for the. Uh, for the for the advice, okay. So so I did that, right? So uh, one, three, and three, and three. Okay. So yeah. So so three people actually did the correct answer, uh, and I'm not sure why one was the answer. Um, uh, but um, uh, anyway, three was the correct answer. And finally, OGM is object document mapping, and ORM is object relational mapping. So they're not algorithms; they are methodologies for mapping data to objects. Uh, object document mapping is the methodology for mapping data in document database, which is a document, which is basically think hierarchical JSON, right? In the most, uh, so basically it says document, but really when people in databases talk about documents, they don't mean uh, they don't mean uh, Shakespeare, you know, Hamlet, right? Uh, they mean or 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 or, or, or the courses say, right? Uh, they mean JSON, right? So object document mapping is a methodology for mapping complex hierarchical data stored in JSON into uh, classes. Object relational mapping is the way to map data stored in a relational SQL database to also classes. So ODM is object document mapping and ORM is object relational mapping. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, uh, so with that, uh, let me wrap up. Actually, we, we are five minutes uh, late, plus the five minutes that we uh, uh, you know delayed in the beginning, delayed the start. So uh, in the next lecture, we will continue with the same topic and study queries, and then after that, we'll use what we learned about the queries, and uh, also uh, you know a package uh, for uh, REST API implementation and build a small web service, uh, namely microservice. Uh, microservices is how modern web applications are built. They don't talk to each other by linking to headers, by calling libraries. Modern web applications or modern software generally, cloud software, components of that software called microservices talk to each other through REST APIs. And I'll talk about how to properly, just like today, we talk about how to properly design a data schema. We'll talk uh, on Wednesday how to properly design microservices, where one microservice ends and the other one begins. And we will use what we studied about the data to build a microservice, and that will conclude the course. Thank you. See you all on Wednesday.